It's Alyssa Hallam from UCLA in, in California. And um, so Alyssa is uh, originally she qualified in biology and chemistry at Williams College in Massachusetts, then went to Yale for a PhD in neuroscience, and then to Caltech in Pasadena with uh, Paul Sternberg, if I'm correct. And they got into the world of um, C. elegans and um, has expanded into a really fascinating combination of behavioral biology, cell biology, um, genetics, and how that all um, integrates to understand how parasites find their host and do a, a lot of other interesting things. Um, so I'm really, um, really pleased to welcome you into our seminar series, Alyssa. Thank you for, for your presentation. Great. Well, thanks so much, Rick, for the introduction and also for the invitation to be here uh, speaking to you. Um, yeah, okay, let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see this okay? It's good. Yes. Okay, great. Um, yes, hi. So uh, today I'm going to tell you about uh, some of the work that my lab has been doing on um, trying to understand host seeking and host invasion in skin penetrating nematodes. We're working with uh, human parasitic nematodes because, as I'm sure you know, they're such a huge global health problem. Um, they cause extensive human disease and infect over a quarter of the world's population. Um, particularly in low resource areas. And these worms are particularly detrimental to children where they can cause stunted growth and long-term cognitive impairments. And a major problem is that our, although there are drugs that uh, will um, clear an existing infection, there are no drugs that prevent infection. And they you know, also don't prevent reinfection in endemic areas. So people are frequently getting reinfected. Drug resistance is also a growing concern. This is also already a huge problem for um, nematodes that infect livestock, and it's likely to be a problem for nematodes that infect humans in the near future. And so uh, because of this, new strategies for preventing nematode infections are pretty urgently needed. And so our hope in my lab is that by understanding more about the basic biology of these worms, this could lead to the development of new strategies for preventing infection. The worm that we uh, focus on in my lab is the skin-penetrating nematode Strongylite stercoralis, also known as the human threadworm. Uh, the infective larvae of Strongylites, there's an infective larvae here, they're, they're about half a millimeter long, and they live in the soil where they actively search for a human host to infect, and they do this by navigating through the soil. And then when they encounter a human host, usually someone walking barefoot through contaminated soil, they infect by penetrating directly through the skin, so usually the skin of the feet. Strongylites is found in warm climates uh, throughout the world, particularly um, in regions with poor uh, sanitation infrastructure. And overall, it's estimated to infect about 610 million people worldwide. And in healthy individuals, uh, these infections can be asymptomatic. Uh, the, there's also usually the acute infection causes gastrointestinal distress. Um, but one of the most important things about strongylites is that these infections can be fatal for immunosuppressed individuals. In my lab, we're focusing on this question of how the infective larvae find and invade human hosts. So as I mentioned, these infective larvae are soil dwelling and they actively navigate through the soil searching for a host to infect. Um, but how they did this was poorly understood. And so we have looked at the sensory cues that uh, drive these infective larvae toward humans. And then more recently, we've also started to look at the uh, cues that enable these worms once they found a human host to actually penetrate through the skin of the feet. So in the first part of the talk, I'll tell you about um, the, our work on host seeking behavior. And then uh, in the second part of the talk, I'll tell you about some of our more recent and um, all unpublished work on skin penetration. Okay, so starting with how these worms find a host. Um, these worms, well, human hosts give off many sensory cues that these worms could be using to uh, detect a human. This includes odors. We go, give off hundreds of different odors in our skin and sweat. Also heat, um, there are gases present. We give off carbon dioxide, obviously oxygen's an environmental cue. We have gustatory cues like sodium chloride on our skin. And then we also create vibrations as we walk through soil. And so my lab is um, currently looking at the response of these worms to uh, all of these different sensory cues. But the one that I'm going to tell you about today is the response of these worms to heat. 
Uh, and this work was done by a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, Astra Bryant. Well, postdoctoral fellow for another week. She's about to start her own lab at University of Washington in January. So she'll be with us in my lab for one more week. Okay, so to look at how these worms respond to heat, um, Astra uses a large format thermotaxis assay in which we have um, a metal plate. And on top of that plate, we have a 22 by 22 centimeter arena with an auger surface. And then we can heat one side of the plate and cool the other side to create a really precisely controlled um, linear uh, thermal gradient. And then we put the worms on top of the auger and we let them navigate in this thermal gradient and we track their movement using a camera that's suspended above the setup. This is an example of what these assays look like. So in this case, the temperature gradient ranges from 21 degrees to 34 degrees. And so just to orient you to the temperatures, 21 degrees, you know, obviously is a little less than normal room temperature. 34 degrees is roughly our skin surface temperature. We put the worms at 23 degrees uh, at ambient temperature. And at this magnification, these worms are these little black dots and there are thousands of these worms on the plate. And then what you can see is that the worms will migrate extremely robustly uh, up this temperature gradient. This is actually one of the most um, robust behaviors we've observed. So. Um, you know, after only a couple of minutes, almost 100% of the worms will be plastered on the warm side of the plate at uh, skin surface temperature. So these worms uh, show a very uh, robust response to body heat. And here, yeah, you can see that they're just, you know, collecting at the warmest region of the plate. We can also look at this by tracking the movement of individual worms. And so here in this assay, we, uh, this gray um, bar indicates the starting point of the worms, which is at room temperature. Their starting point, the track of each worm is indicated uh, by this line. So for example, here, the black dot indicates the starting point and then the red line here indicates the trajectory of a single worm. And again, you can see that most of the worms, uh, well, all of these worms go very robustly up the thermal gradient. So the worms like body heat, and this raises the question of what is the neural basis of heat seeking? And so this is, uh, was really the focus now trying to understand how these worms um, are attracted to heat. To get at the neural basis of heat seeking in the uh, parasitic worms, which can be difficult to work with, uh, we turned to the free living model worm C. elegans as a starting point for understanding the parasitic worms. Um, and the reason for this is that, um, you know, of course the neural basis of sensory behavior in C. elegans is very well studied. In addition, C. elegans and strongyloides, uh, both nematodes, they share many of the same genes and neurons. But I do want to point out that these species are not closely related. So Strongylides and C. elegans are estimated to have diverged about 200 million years ago. So there isn't always a one-to-one -one correspondence of gene or gene function in C. elegans and Strongylides. But nevertheless, we can use C. elegans as a starting point for trying to understand the parasitic worms. Another important point is that C. elegans and Strongylides show very different uh, behaviors, including very different thermosensory behaviors. And I'll briefly explain the thermosensory behavior of C. elegans for those not familiar with it. Um, basically, C. elegans, the free living worm, likes its cultivation temperature. So if you cultivate the worms at a particular temperature and then you put them in a thermal gradient below that temperature, they'll migrate up the gradient in the direction of their cultivation temperature. And conversely, if you put them above their cultivation temperature, they'll go down the gradient toward cultivation temperature. C. elegans also has a separate noxious heat avoidance response. And for that, if you put them at warmer temperatures that C. elegans uh, does not like, these are the temperatures that the parasitic worms really like, um, C. elegans has a noxious avoidance response where it will move rapidly down the thermal gradient. This is in contrast to uh, the behavior of the human parasite that I've already showed you. So in Strongylides circularis, if you put it at or above cultivation temperature, they move really robustly up the thermal gradient. Strongylides also does have a negative thermotaxis behavior where it will move down the gradient. So if you put it below its cultivation temperature, it will move down the thermal gradient. This is a form of environmental navigation. And I'm not gonna tell you more about that because we're really focused on this heat seeking behavior that drives them toward a human host. But I will say that all of the mechanisms we found that mediate positive thermotaxis or heat seeking also mediate negative thermotaxis. But the important point here is that C. elegans and strongylides have completely different thermosensory behaviors. And so this leads to the question of how these species specific behaviors arise. So to get at this question, we decided to look first at the molecular mechanisms that might be mediating heat seeking and or thermal sensation in strongylides. 
uh, based on what we know about C. elegans. And in C. elegans, we know that there are multiple molecular pathways that mediate thermosensation. There's a CGMP pathway and a trip channel pathway. Uh, the CGMP pathway um, is involved in thermotaxis navigation in the comfortable temperature range for C. elegans, which is about 15 to 25 degrees. And in this pathway, um, basically temperature is detected by receptor guanylate cyclases, which act as thermoreceptors. And these RGCs act upstream of the CGMP gated cation channel uh, encoded by, uh, by the TAX2 and TAX4 uh, genes. And activation of this um, TAX2, TAX4 channel depolarizes thermosensory neurons and leads to thermotaxis behavior. There's also this uh, trip channel pathway, which mediates noxious temperature sensing. This pathway uh, is present in a separate set of neurons, the noxious temperature sensing neurons. Um, and this pathway is a little bit less well understood, but temperature somehow probably um, indirectly activates a uh, trip B channel um, consisting of the subunits OSM9 and OCR2. And activation of this trip B channel depolarizes the neuron and leads to noxious heat avoidance. So we didn't know which of these pathways, if either, would be involved um, in heat-seeking in strongylides. Uh, on the one hand, the heat-seeking behavior of strongylides is a little more similar to thermotaxis navigation in C. elegans. But then on the other hand, the um, temperatures that strongylides likes are in the noxious temperature range for C. elegans. So you know, indicating it might be the trip channel pathway. But we decided to start by looking at the CGMP signaling pathway. And in particular, we focused on the TAX4 gene. Um, and that's because in C. elegans, it was known that uh, if you disrupt TAX4, you lose thermotaxis navigation. So we asked, um, does strongylides have a TAX4 gene? Um, and if so, is it required for heat seeking? We found that strongylides uh, does in fact have a TAX4 gene. Um, it shares about 60% amino acid identity with the C. elegans uh, TAX4 protein. Um, and when we made a reporter construct, it looked like it was expressed in the head. So we thought, okay, this is a possible candidate for something that might be involved in thermotaxis navigation and strongylides. So to see if it is involved, we decided to knock it out using uh, CRISPR. And I'll briefly explain how we do this. So we relatively recently developed a method for disrupting genes in strongylides using CRISPR. Uh, and the way this works, it, make, it takes advantage of the fact that strongylides worms can actually cycle through a single free living generation in the environment. So we can get free living uh, female adult strongylides, but all of the progeny of these adults become infected larvae and need to go through a host. But it is possible to get free living adults. And so we take these free living adults and we inject um, the CRISPR components as DNA plasmids into these free living adults, into their gonad. And so that's a plasmid encoding um, the Cas9 endonuclease, a plasmid encoding a single guide RNA, and a plasmid with a red marker for a template for homology directed repair. So we microinject all of these plasmids into the gonad of the free-living females and hope that their progeny will take up the DNA and be transgenics or knockouts. And so then we screen the progeny, which are all infected larvae. Um, we screen for worms that are red um, and these red worms are candidate knockouts, but they're not all knockouts. So uh, some of these red worms will be um, mosaic. Some will have heterozygous mutations. Um, some actually won't have any mutations. They'll just be expressing red from this plasmid. And then a subset of these will be the homozygous knockouts that we want. So we take these red worms. We don't really know their genotype. We then subject them to single worm behavioral assays. And then we collect them afterward and gene PCR genotype them post hoc. Uh, so all of the behavior for the CRISPR knockouts that I'm showing you is done uh, completely blind to genotype. And then the worms were genotyped after, and I'm just showing you the data for the worms that we cons confirmed were homozygous deletions of the tax 4 gene in this case. So this is what we found. Uh, first, our control worms are no Cas9 control worms. So they were generated the same way as the knockout worms, but we omitted the plasmid encoding Cas9. So there should not be any mutations. Um, and here they're placed in a thermal gradient. In this case, they, the starting temperature is 30 degrees because we know that wild type worms show really robust uh, heat seeking under these conditions. And as you can see, uh, all of these lines indicate the trajectories of individual worms. And you can see almost all of them go very robustly up toward the skin surface temperature here. In contrast, when we uh, knock out the TAX4 gene, this completely disrupts thermotaxis navigation. Now the worms basically just wander uh, randomly on the plates. And we can quantify this by just looking at how far the worms move up the thermal gradient. You can see the control worms move up the gradient, whereas the TAX4 knockout worms do not. 
So this indicates that tax four um, is required for uh, heat seeking behavior. So getting to the question of how species specific behaviors are generated, um, we know that it's not that these worms use different uh, signal transduction pathways, they both use a CGMP pathway for detecting temperature that involves this tax four gene. So we thought, okay, well, uh, maybe the difference is at the level of the sensory neurons. And in C. elegans, uh, the primary thermosensory neurons are known to be these uh, neurons called the AFD neurons. It's a pair of neurons located in the head of the worm. And if you lose these neurons, you lose thermotaxis navigation. So we uh, asked whether Strongyloides AFD neurons uh, are required for heat seeking. And to do this, um, we chemogenetically silenced the Strongyloides AFD neurons using the histamine gated chloride channel HisCl1. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this, but this is a commonly used uh, technique in C. elegans. Um, and it works because um, worms do not have endogenous histamine. And so we can take this Drosophila histamine gated uh, chloride channel and express it in the neurons of interest, in this case, the AFD neurons. And then when we expose the worms to histamine, this will activate this channel specifically in the AFD neurons and then silence the neurons. And so um, the way this works in Strongyloides is we again, take advantage of these free living females and we inject into them uh, plasmids encoding uh, just a green a GFP marker for the AFD neurons. So the AFD promoter driving GFP and also AFD promoter driving um, the HisCl1 gene. Then we collect progeny from these free living females. And again, all of the progeny are infective larvae. So we collect ones that are green and then we assume or hope that these green worms express the HisCl1 channel. And then we treat these green infective larvae to either BU saline, which is just our buffered saline control, or histamine dissolved in buffered saline, and then subject the worms to behavioral assays. Using this approach, uh, what we found is that the control worms that were not exposed to histamine travel up the thermal gradient, but when we expose the worms to histamine to silence AFD, this severely impairs uh, heat-seeking behavior. You can see most of the worms don't really leave this initial 30 degree zone where they start out. A couple of them do make it partway up the gradient, and that's probably because um, we're not uh, fully silencing the AFD neuron in every case. Um, but you can see there's a difference in, in how far they move up the gradient. The AFD silence worms move significantly less far up the gradient. So based on this, we can conclude that these AFD neurons are in fact required for heat seeking. So C. elegans and Strongyloides not only use the same sensory transduction pathway, but they use the same sensory neurons for mediating uh, thermotaxis behavior. And so we then asked, well, does Strongyloides circularis AFD encode temperature differently from the C. elegans AFD neurons? And so to address this, we uh, perform calcium imaging uh, from the AFD neurons in the two species using basically exactly the same uh, stimulus. And we use calcium imaging, uh, we do this using the ratio metric calcium indicator, yellow chameleon, YC 3.60. So this is a genetically encoded calcium indicator, um, meaning we just make transgenic worms that express this calcium indicator um, specifically in the AFD neurons so we can monitor neural activity. And this is what we found. Um, so basically we found that the AFD neurons do show very species specific temperature encoding properties. So what you're looking at here is worms that were administered a temperature ramp. So in this case, the temperature goes from 20 degrees to uh, 34 degrees. Um, and the gray arrow here indicates ambient temperature and red indicates uh, skin surface temperature. So if you look first at the C. elegans AFD neurons, you can see that as the temperature crosses ambient, you get a huge increase in neural activity, meaning the AFD neurons become very active. Um, and they stay active as the temperature continues to increase. Uh, but at these warmer temperatures, the AFD neurons are active, but you can see that they're not very faithfully encoding the, amb the ambient temperature. The response is kind of all over the place. So, re but really these AFD neurons are showing a very large increase in neural activity around uh, ambient temperature. And this pattern of neural activity is completely different from what we see in the Strongyloides AFD neurons. So in Strongyloides AFD neurons, we see an initial warming induced hyperpolarization followed by this almost linear increase in neural activity all the way from ambient temperature up to and, and past, or up to um, you know, skin surface temperature. And so uh, this indicates that, these, that temperature encoding is completely different in these two species in ways that we think make sense um, for the ethology of these species. And so C. elegans, which migrates toward its cultivation temperature, 
the AFD neurons are really specialized for asking, is the worm above or below ambient temperature? Whereas in the case of the Strongyloides AFD neurons, uh, the neurons are instead specialized for asking, where is the worm in a thermal gradient that ranges from ambient to body heat? So then finally getting to this question of how um, species specific behaviors arise, we found that at least in the case of thermal sensation, species specific behaviors arise at the very earliest stages of sensory processing due to differences in sensory encoding in the primary sensory neurons. Um, and in the case of the free living worm, the sensory uh, encoding in AFD is really asking, is the ambient temperature changing? Whereas in the parasite, the human parasite is asking, is the worm approaching host body temperature? All right, so now I've told you a little bit about how these worms find their hosts uh, from a distance. And so for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna switch gears and talk about how these worms um, invade human skin once they've found a host. And this work was done by Ruhi Patel, a postdoctoral fellow in the lab, and Courtney McClure, a graduate student. To look at how uh, these worms invade human well, invade skin. We're, right now we're using an ex vivo assay for skin penetration. Um, we're using rat skin. So we're taking a euthanized rat and removing the skin. And then we shave and wax the skin to remove all the fur and place the skin into a well of a multi-well plate. Um, we then isolate Strongyloides stercoralis and Strongyloides rati infective larvae. So, so far I've been talking about the human parasite, Strongyloides stercoralis. In these experiments, we use both Strongyloides stercoralis and also Strongyloides rati, a closely related rat parasite. Um, and the reason for that is that we have, you know, easy access to rat skin, uh, not human skin. And so by comparing responses of these worms on rat skin, we can compare the response of a worm of Strongyloides rati on skin of its host and also Strongyloides stercoralis on skin of a non-host. We're currently working on getting human skin samples, but for now, what we've tested is uh, rat skin. Okay, so, so we take these infective larvae, uh, we stain them with a fluorescent dye to ensure that the worms are visible on the surface of the skin. And then we place the worms onto the skin and we observe their behavior under a fluorescent microscope for 10 minutes. So I'll show you a video of what this looks like. And basically what you're gonna see is the worm um, will be, is crawling around on the surface of the skin and you'll see it start to penetrate uh, into the skin a little bit, and then it backs up and crawls around and penetrates elsewhere, which is a pretty typical behavior. Okay, so here's the worm. So now its head is poking into the skin and it's trying to get in, but it backs up and you can see now it crawls around on the skin, um, locates another spot, or it will in a second. So now it's located another spot and here it just pokes its way in head first. And then now the worm has disappeared beneath the surface of the skin. And you can see a little uh, bit of dye. So the, the fluorescent dye we use kind of coats the outside of the worm. And so it leaves a little bit of a trail as the worm crawls around. And then as it penetrates, uh, it deposits some dye on the surface. So you can actually see exactly where the worm went into the skin. So this is the basic uh, behavior that we're looking at. Um, and to quantify this, Ruhi first just looked at the percentage of worms that penetrate into the skin for either the rat parasite, Strongyloides rati, or the human parasite, Strongyloides stercoralis. And in both cases, she found that about 80% of the worms penetrate into the rat skin. However, what we found really interesting was that in the case of Strongyloides stercoralis, most of the worms subsequently reemerge on the surface of the skin. So that doesn't happen with the rat parasite. So with Strongyloides rati, which is on its host skin, it goes in into the skin and stays into the skin. But in the case of the human parasite, about 80% of the worms that go into the skin subsequently come back out on the surface of the skin. And so we assume that this is a behavior that these worms are doing because they're on the skin of a non-host and that there's some cue in the rat skin that's telling them, you know, this is not host skin and forcing, causing them to reemerge. Um, you know, whether it's mechanosensory or hemosensory, we don't know. Um, now, at this point, it is also possible that Strongyloides stercoralis just always shows this behavior, that it always just goes in and out of skin. We haven't uh, tested human skin samples yet. Um, so we are in the process of getting human skin samples so that we can uh, look at the behavior on um, human skin. But there does seem to be a species-specific difference here, uh, at least when they're on rat skin. To quantify this more precisely, Courtney looked at the percentage of worms that penetrate every two minutes over the course of 10 minutes. Um, and you can see that the worms start to penetrate the skin pretty rapidly. So already after two minutes, about 20% of the worms have penetrated and then just more and more worms penetrate over the course of 10 minutes. 
to quantify this and figure out, well, to figure out more precisely what was happening, Ruhi um, decided to track the worms on the surface of the skin. And so that's what you're looking at here. Um, basically the, the little X um, indicates the start where the worms um, are placed initially on the skin. And then she quantified all the behaviors that they show that she sees on the skin. So um, the little circle indicates a pushing behavior where the worm is pushing its head down onto the skin, but not actually successfully penetrating the surface. And a little green X here indicates a successful puncture of the skin where it has breached the skin surface and poked its head in. And a um, pink square, he means an aborted attempt. So it pokes in, but then comes out. That happens a lot. And then a green box indicates completing penetration. So what you can see here is that the worms do engage in multiple behavioral events before they penetrate. So for example, this worm here, you can see that it pushes down on the surface of the skin a bunch of times before it finally punctures and completes penetration. And you know, in the case of this worm here, it pushes down. Subsequently, it actually punctures the skin, but then it comes back up and crawls around a little bit more and completes penetration somewhere else. But from all these tracks, you can see they do go into the skin pretty quickly. And actually, in this case, for example, the worm just went right in at the spot it was initially placed. So they'll crawl around a little bit and exhibit a bunch of different behaviors before finally penetrating into the skin. And Another way to look at that uh, is to use a raster plot. So here we're just looking at the different events that happen on rat skin. Um, this is work by Courtney. And she's looking at either puncture events in blue or extrication events where it pulls its head back out in yellow or completion in red. And so what you can see is that the worms engage in a bunch of uh, puncture and extrication events before completing penetration, many cases. But this does vary from worm to worm. So for example, worm 10 here, it uh, punctures the skin and then completes penetration a few seconds later. Whereas worm 51 here, so each row here corresponds to an individual worm and its behaviors over time. And so in row 51 here, you can see the worm punctures, comes back out, punctures, comes back out, repeats this until around nine minutes, it finally goes in. So there's a bit of variability. This is with Strongyloides rati on rat skin. Courtney then looked at what happened to Strongyloides rati on a non-host skin. So she looked on uh, guinea pig skin and what we found is that they penetrate less frequently on non-host skin. Here you can see there are a lot more puncture and extrication events without completion of penetration. Um, so in many cases, the worms are puncturing, coming back out, puncturing, coming back out, but never actually make it all the way in. And to quantify that, we can look at the time it takes the worms to initiate penetration. You can see it takes, this is for Strongyloides rat eye on either rat skin, host skin, or guinea pig skin, which is non-host skin. And you can see that it takes longer for the worms to initiate penetration on non-host skin. And there are also more extrication events where they come back out, they pull their head back out uh, on non-host skin. However, uh, interestingly, or what I found interesting is that the time to complete penetration is the same on um, host versus non-host skin. And so this suggests, at least to me, that, that they're capable, fully capable of penetrating into guinea pig skin. And you know, once they've started to go in, if they complete penetration, it takes the same amount of time. So we don't think that it's, you know, that the guinea pig skin is just tougher or something, or you know, they're less physically able to get in. If they choose to go all the way in, they can complete penetration in the same amount of time. It just seems like they're choosing to penetrate into the skin less frequently, less, and they do it less readily. Okay, so this is um, a little bit about behavior. So uh, just like with thermosensation, what we really don't want to know or what are the mechanisms that drive this behavior? So this worm, this work is in the really early stages, but we begin, we've begun to look at the mechanism. And just as with, Thermal sensation, we wanted to turn to C. elegans to get a sense of what mechanisms might be driving this behavior. Uh, but of course, the tricky thing here is that C. elegans is not a skin penetrating worm, and so it doesn't engage in anything resembling skin penetration behavior. So it wasn't really clear what uh, pathways to look at in C. elegans. Um, but we hypothesized that perhaps um, dopamine signaling might be involved in skin penetration. And the reason for this is that um, C. elegans is known to have eight dopaminergic neurons that sense texture. So um, C. elegans has these uh, CEP neurons, four CEP neurons in the head of the worm. They also have a pair of ADE neurons a little farther back in the head, and then a pair of PDE neurons much farther back in the body. These are the eight dopaminergic neurons of C. elegans, and they're all mechanosensory neurons that sense texture. And specifically, they sense the texture as the worm is crawling uh, on a plate, so crawling on an auger surface in a, like in a bacterial lawn. These neurons are the ones that sense the texture of the bacteria that the worm is crawling through and cause the slowing response where C. elegans slows down when it encounters a bacterial lawn. And so we wondered whether strongyloides might have, you know, homologous dopaminergic neurons that sense the texture of the skin as the worms crawl on the surface of the skin 
and tell the worms whether or not to penetrate into the skin. So to test this possibility, uh, we looked at the effect of dopamine on skin penetration. So we um, exposed the worms to dopamine. We soaked them in dopamine and looked at how it affects skin penetration behavior. And what we found is that exposing the worms to dopamine stimulates skin penetration. So first we looked at the time to initiate penetration and you can see that the worms penetrate, uh, initiate penetration more quickly in the presence of dopamine. And then we looked at the time to complete penetration and they also complete penetration more quickly in the presence of dopamine. To figure out what was going on in more detail, uh, Ruhi tracked the worms. So same type of behavioral tracking I've already shown you. And in fact, I've already shown you these control traces. These are some representative control traces of worms not exposed to dopamine. We found that when we expose them to dopamine, however, the worms penetrate the skin almost immediately. Uh, most of them don't crawl around on the surface of the skin at all. Most of them just go right in to the skin uh, as soon as they're placed on the skin. Occasionally they do crawl around a little bit and engage in a bunch of behavioral events before penetrating, but they crawl significantly less than they do um, without dopamine. To further confirm this phenotype, we also looked at what happens in the presence of the dopamine receptor antagonist Haldol. So this blocks the dopamine receptor and um, thereby blocks dopamine signaling. And when we expose the worms to Haldol, you can see this has the opposite effect. Now, most of the worms crawl on the skin instead of, uh, you know, instead of penetrating or before they penetrate, they crawl a lot more. So for example, here, this worm crawled all around on the skin and actually never ended up penetrating. Um, this worm crawled around. In some cases, the worms do, you know, this one started here, crawled around uh, and eventually did end up penetrating, but you can see that they uh, crawl much more on the surface of the skin at the expense of penetration. We quantified the effects of Haldol uh, by looking at a bunch of different parameters. So we've looked at um, the time to initiate penetration and you can see the worms take longer to initiate penetration in the presence of this dopamine receptor antagonist. They also travel, here we're looking at total distance traveled on the surface of the skin. And you can see the worms uh, crawl more on the surface of the skin in the presence of the dopamine receptor antagonist. And finally, they engage in fewer penetration attempts uh, when dopamine signaling and block is blocked. So all of this, um, suggests that dopamine signaling stimulates skin penetration. And then um, to further confirm this, we uh, administered Haldol as well as dopamine to see if dopamine could rescue the, um, Haldol, the phenotype we see with the Haldol, the receptor antagonist, and we found that you can. So here we're looking at distance travel. So control worms versus Haldol, you can see that the Haldol worms travel more on the surface of the skin, but when we add dopamine along with the Haldol, this rescues this phenotype. And similarly, when we look at the percent of the time that the worms spend pushing down on the surface of the skin, um, you can see that uh, in the presence of Haldol, they spend less time pushing down on the surface of the skin, so simply attempting to penetrate. And this effect is also rescued by adding dopamine. So this just confirms that the effects that were with uh, this dopamine receptor antagonist, this drug, are actually due to uh, blocking dopamine signaling. Um, and so together, this just suggests that um, you know, dopamine signaling is required uh, or plays an important role in skin penetration behavior. Um, and so we're now, you know, like I said, this is in pretty early stages and we're now in the process of um, trying to use CRISPR to disrupt uh, genes in the dopaminergic pathway. Um, you know, for example, um, the do dopamine biosynthesis genes and dopamine reuptake genes to see if this blocks skin penetration or at least to see if it uh, significantly delay skin penetration. And the other thing we're doing is we're trying to um, target the dopaminergic neurons. So we're generating uh, reporter constructs that will express specifically in the dopaminergic neurons to uh, chemogenetically silence those neurons to see if this blocks skin penetration. In addition, we, we don't think that, um, you know, that, that dopamine is the, that dopaminergic neurons are the only neurons that play a role in skin penetration. So we are also trying to identify other neurons that play a role in skin penetration. And so to do this, we've um, started to identify other putative mechanosensory neurons in strongyloides. And so the way we did this is we generated promoter GFP constructs for several different, um, for the homologs of several genes that in C. elegans are known to play an important role in mechanosensation. So MAC4, MAC10, OSM9, OCR2. Uh, Ruhi has generated uh, GFP reporter constructs for all of these different um, genes and strongyloides, and we found that they're all expressed in subsets of neurons throughout the body, as you can see indicated by the little uh, white arrowheads here. 
And the position of these neurons uh, in the head and throughout the body um, is consistent with the position of the mechanosensory neurons in C. elegans. And so we think that we've now genetically labeled a number of different mechanosensory neurons and strontulates. And so the next steps here are we'd like to go in and um, inactivate these genes using CRISPR to see if they're required for skin penetration. We also plan to silence uh, all of these different putative mechanosensory neurons, um, again, using this histamine-gated chloride channel HCL1 to see if this impairs skin penetration. And then finally, we'd like to um, monitor neural activity from these neurons uh, by calcium imaging upon exposure to host skin. And so um, our hope is that we can uh, put unrestrained animals on host skin because once they encounter host skin, they don't move that much. They usually start to penetrate um, and actually image neural activity while they're penetrating to get a sense of how these worms are responding to contact with host skin. All right, so basically, uh, just to summarize what I've told you, um, we're trying to understand how these worms uh, seek out and infect hosts using sensory cues, both um, thermosensory cues, mechanosensory cues, and also other cues I haven't talked about, including uh, chemosensory cues. Um, and our hope is that uh, a better understanding of you know, how these worms both um, find hosts and also uh, penetrate into their hosts uh, will lead to new strategies for um, blocking these behaviors and thereby preventing infections. And for example, in the case of um, skin penetration, uh, the worms are clearly detecting sensory cues on the surface of the skin. And so kind of our long-term dream is if we could develop a, you know, a topical cream or something that, you know, sort of like an insect repellent that prevents skin penetration, this could um, block the process and prevent the worms from infecting. All right, and then finally, I just want to um, acknowledge all the people in my lab and in particular mention the um, people who did this work. So as I mentioned, Astra Bryant, uh, she's a postdoctoral fellow for another week. She'll be starting her lab at uh, the University of Washington. Um, studying uh, thermosensation in strontulates. She did all the work I told you about on thermosensation. And then uh, Courtney McClure, a graduate student, and Rui Patel, a postdoc, they did all of the work on um, skin penetration. And I'm happy to answer questions. Um, thank you so much. That was really great. So if you have any questions, please raise your hands if you're happy for me to um, allow you to talk or put it in the chat if you'd prefer to uh, prefer me to ask it. Um, I had one question to start with on the sure. thermoregulation differences between elegans and strongolides. If you were to habituate them to the opposite temperatures, do you think you'd see changes in the response of the neurons? Yeah, yeah, yes, that's a great question. We do see responses in neurons. So, and this happens in C. elegans and the parasitic worms. So if you in the experiments I showed you, we were cultivating them at 23 degrees, but if you cultivate the worms at, um, at different temperatures, for example, at cooler temperature, it does change the thermal uh, threshold for AFD response, and it also changes thermotaxis behavior. So for example, worms will engage in positive thermotaxis or heat seeking when they're placed above their cultivation temperature. So if you put them at 23, if you grade, cultivate them at 23 degrees and place them at 20, above 23, they'll go up the gradient. If you cultivate them at 15 degrees and put them at 17 degrees, they'll go up the thermal gradient. So yeah, they are adapting to their ambient temperature and they're adjusting their heat seeking uh, behavior accordingly so that they can still detect an increase in ambient temperature. And those changes are reflected in changes in the AFD neurons. Cool, so is it known what okay. mediates those changes? Sorry, Rick. Um, that is a great question. Not really. I think there is some evidence in C. elegans um, from different labs, including Kelly Singupa's lab, that that has to do with um, changes in the thermal receptors. Um, you know, whether it's expression or phosphorylation, like something like that. But the thermal receptors themselves are mediating those changes. And I should, I didn't, I didn't mention this, but we have actually identified the strongylides thermal receptor proteins. So in C. elegans, are these receptor guanylate cyclases that are required for thermosensation and strongylides, we found homologs that are also required, well, that, that are heat sensitive. So when we place them in C. elegans, they confer a temperature response and they all respond uh, to temperatures around body heat. And so uh, we think that there's a lot of adaptation in the receptors themselves. And so I would guess that in strongylides, a lot of those changes in um, thermal threshold have to do with receptors. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Rick, please. Yeah, that's great. I mean, one of the things that surprises me 
is that the positive and negative behaviors are controlled by different pathways. If I, if I got it right, so you said it was like the noxious pathway is, is like, yeah. be different. So uh, I'm trying to work out how do, how will it evolve? How can it adapt if the, there are two separate pathways for positive and negative? You know, I always would have assumed that there'd be a simple sort of calibration that the particular temperature would change over time. But um, what, what you're saying is the, the receptor or, or the sensory system has to disconnect from one pathway and wire itself into another pathway to change. Oh, well, from... okay, so, so let me clarify. So, so in C. elegans, uh, it's the same pathway for positive and negative thermotaxis within its normal temperature range. So in the 15 to 25 degree range, that's like it's comfortable temperature range when it's crawling around, it is exactly what you said where it's just a change in the direction they're going that's, that's mediated by the same pathway, by temperature sensing in the same pathway involving these AFD neurons. But if you do put C. elegans at a much warmer temperature outside of where it normally tries to go, it has a separate noxious temperature response. And I think that's just like an avoidance emergency response. Pathway. Yeah, that, that's like, yeah, exactly. There's like an emergency, get me out of here because I'm gonna die if I stay at this temperature yeah. response and that okay. just drives them away okay. from the stimulus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in strongyloides, we've never seen that kind of avoidance response, even at warmer temperatures, but we can't test extremely hot temperatures that easily. In our, so in our thermotaxis setup, the kind of the warmest temperatures we can get to without the system breaking and the auger melting um, yeah. is around yeah. 42 degrees, but we haven't seen a strong avoidance response so it's kind of an open question at this point, whether the avoidance pathway in C. elegans that mediates that emergency noxious avoidance response is doing the same thing in strongyloides. It may be that it actually contributes to heat seeking in some way. That's something we haven't looked at yet, but an interesting area to look at. Right, right. Um, Colette, do you like to ask your question? Yep. Yeah, it was really nice talk, Lisa. Great. I was just wondering about genes such as the tax 4 gene or other genes in that same pathway. Is there anything known about their expression or how conserved they are in parasitic species that don't need to have host sensing behavior. So something that I'm just thinking of parasites that are orally ingested and they don't need to actually seek out a host. Is there much less expression of these genes and can we can, can we use expression information to sort of learn about host seeking? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, so I guess I, we don't exactly know. Okay, so I will say they have tax for homologs, uh, at least some many species do. Um, we haven't looked at expression in, you know, genes like in, in worms like H. polygyrus or something that are passively ingested. What I can say is we have placed them in thermal gradients and they do move up thermal gradients, uh, just like the skin penetrating worms. Uh, so I think it is not the case that the passively ingested worms do not engage in any kind of host seeking. They seem to, they respond to host odors and they do move up thermal gradients. And so we think that this helps them position themselves in the vicinity of a host. And that's our guess where they're more likely to be ingested. Um, yeah, we were surprised. I mean, initially we kind of thought, well, maybe they won't heat seek because, you know, they don't have to because they're just ingested, but, but they do, they will go up a thermal gradient, uh, you know, not quite as robustly as the strongyloides, as strongyloides stercoralis. Well, nothing is really as robust as the human parasite. <laughs> strongyloides stercoralis is extremely robust in its ability to find a human. Um, but yeah, you know, we've looked at H. polygyrus and they will go up a thermal gradient as well. So I would guess that tax four is involved. And the other thing I should say is that I think you know, for tax four, it probably is also involved in environmental sensing. It's certainly required for negative thermotaxis. Um, and so all of these worms engage in both positive and negative thermotaxis. And so I would assume that tax four is involved in environmental navigation as well. So I don't know if we could use it as a marker for, um, you know, worms that can, can heat seek to detect a host, but that is a great point. It would be really nice to have something like that. Um, but yeah, there may be something, but I think a lot of these pathways are reused for environmental navigation. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, Hi, uh, Elsa, that was a great talk. Thanks very much. Um, I was curious about um, how Strongyloides stercoralis goes into rat skin and then comes out again. So, um, I mean, I, I, do you know what happens to Strongyloides rati once it gets into rat skin? I mean, can you visualize that? Does it penetrate lymphatics or, I mean, how does it get to where it's going? And, and does Strongyloides stercoralis not do that because it doesn't have the right signal? Or I, I guess I'm just curious about the difference between the two species. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think we we don't really know exactly what's happening right now because we haven't been able to follow them uh, very far beneath the surface of the skin. 
Um, I mean, I will say that you can, you can get Strongylus sacralis to go into the rat skin. So, okay, we've only so far used ex vivo assays. And if you put it, the skin on um, solution so that when they go through it, uh, they go into solution, like they will, both species can go through into solution. Uh, so they can penetrate. I mean, I guess the most of that tells you is they can penetrate through the skin and they can penetrate through the fat layer that's underneath the skin and come out the other side. Um, so I, I don't know if they're, yeah, I think it's not totally clear yet whether it's that the immune system is, is killing them, the human parasite in the rat, or, you know, whether there is a physical, to what extent there's a physical barrier. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think they, they clearly can uh, go through the skin, including through the fat layer, strangely circles on rat skin, because sometimes they do do that. So I don't think it's that they physically can't, you know, digest the rat skin or anything like that. But um, it's more of like a surface behavior where sometimes they just seem to go in and then come right back out, uh, whereas that doesn't seem to happen with rats. So uh, with rat eye on rat skin. So I don't know. I think we'd, um, we would like to be able to trace the, the worms more clearly as they're going into host skin. Um, so we're thinking about ways to do that. And, you know, we're also working on making transgenic parasites that we can label a bit more cleanly because the dye tent that we use tends to rub off as they are crawling through the skin. Um, so we can see them when they're very close to the surface, but yeah, it's, it's very hard to track them so far when they get deeper into the skin. So I, we don't know yet, but that's an important question. Thanks. Yeah. And um, John? Thank you very much. What molecules are being shed as they go through the skin? And do all the, do all the worms shed the same molecules? Yeah, that's a great question. You mean like to digest the skin, the proteases, for example? Um, yeah, so this is something we've started to look at. So these, these worms, um, skin penetrating worms, Strongylides has a large family of metalloproteases, uh, the Estacin family. Um, and this is thought to be, uh, you know, parasitism family, uh, you know, Vicki Hunt characterized these initially, well, not characterized, but identified them in the genome and found that skin penetrating worms and strongylies in particular has a very large expansion of these metalloproteases, which um, are likely to help the worms digest tissue uh, based on um, a bunch of uh, biochemical data with the stasins and also um, what's known about a stasin function in C. elegans uh, that are involved in, uh, you know, molting behaviors, that sort of thing. So what I can say is that um, Strongylides has a lot of these astacin genes and we're just starting to look at them. So there's some older studies uh, suggesting that they are required for digesting the skin, but there's never been direct, exactly direct evidence that they're required because the tools weren't available. But now that we can make knockouts and transgenics, we're very interested in looking at these metalloproteases and identifying ones that might be required for skin penetration. So all I can say, this is, really preliminary from data from like last week, uh, we have made transgenic reporters for some of these astacins and they do seem to be expressed in the head. They seem to be expressed very strongly in the pharynx, suggesting that these are all through the mouth potentially. Um, we don't know if they're secreted through the mouth. I think that's very possible, although the mouth is supposed to be sealed off, but um, they're at high levels in the pharyngeal cells. Um, and we're currently in the process of trying to target some of the ones that are very highly expressed in infective larvae to see if this prevents penetration. But based on the previous literature, our hypothesis is that a subset of these astacin metalloprotease genes are required for them to digest the tissue as they penetrate the skin. Cool. Um, Rick? Yeah, just to follow up on that, I mean, that makes it all the more surprising that they then expend resources in... Um, in leaving the skin. And so they, they have to digest their way out as well as digest the way in and do it all over again. It just seems extraordinary. Um, yeah. Well, so so the weird thing, I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they they probably seem to be expressing these stasins all the time to some extent as infective larvae, right? I think the response they they can penetrate into the skin almost instantly when they're placed on the skin. And so I don't think that, you know, the stasins, I don't know that there's really time for them to upregulate expression of these stasins or, you know, I guess they could be, uh, you know, cleaved to form an, you know, an active stasin, but it happens so fast. I mean, especially with the dopamine mutants, you or when not dopamine mutants, when you expose the worms to dopamine, I mean, you just put them on the skin and they can go in almost instantly. So I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that's a really good question. Like, 
just more generally, are they wasting energy secreting assassins all the time, even when they're not in contact with host skin? <laughs> and if not, how are they doing it so fast that they can penetrate almost instantly? And yeah, why are they bothering to come back out? I mean, presumably, I mean, the strongly circles cannot successfully infect the rat. So it makes sense, I guess, that if they, you know, realize it's a mistake, if they stay in the rat, they're not going to survive. Uh, so I guess for survival, it would make sense for them to get back out, but you know, why they don't have more of a selection initially, like why do they even bother going in in the first place? I don't know, except perhaps that they're, perhaps they're just always secreting these metalloproteases mm. that let them penetrate and they just are kind of crawling because the metalloproteases are enabling that. But yeah, those are great questions. I, I mean, this is something that we're really, really interested in looking at and we're, um, yeah, we're, we're in the process of trying to <laughs> get answers great. to some of these questions. Yeah. yeah. So cool. I just had one really um, basic question. Do these worms survive fever? So if their host gets a fever, will they survive? Or does fever kill them? Yeah, that's a great question. I, someone else might know the answer to this. So far as I know, I don't think anyone has really looked very carefully at the worm surviving fever, but I would say that they do to certainly to some extent, because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, strongylides is a worm that can cause chronic infections, right? So you know, this is a worm that I didn't, I didn't go into this, but they can actually, to some extent, they have an auto infective cycle. They can complete their entire life cycle uh, in the same host. And so this is the worm where people can get infected in their twenties and have a latent infection that they don't know about that resurfaces when they're immunosuppressed in their eighties or something. So because it can, you can stay infected for life, you know, presumably people have had fevers over the course of their lives and those worms are still surviving in that environment. I think the, the main question that we don't have answers to, at least in the published literature, is how many of the worms that infect end up causing a chronic infection. I think there's, you know, people talk about strongylides and how it can cause a chronic infection, but there's no numbers to actually back up of the total percent of worms that successfully infect a human, how many can, you know, engage in the auto-infective cycle and last. I mean, are there cases where the immune system does clear them and what we're seeing is a subset of cases where you get a chronic infection or do you always get a chronic infection? I think the, the data just isn't really there to know for sure. So I would say they, they can survive to some extent, but whether some of them do get killed off, I don't know. I mean, I, I would suggest, I would guess though that they're probably fine because they do seem quite able to survive at temperatures a little bit above, uh, you know, around thinking. and above body temperature. Yeah, this lack of noxious thermo um, chemotaxis would suggest that maybe they don't care. I don't know. Right. I mean, exactly. I mean, we haven't cultured them for prolonged periods at mm. fever temperature. So, you know, certainly for acute responses, they seem totally fine. I mean, if we, you know, put them at yeah. warmer temperatures, they're there, you know, we haven't, we, we haven't tried culturing them for like multiple days uh, at warmer than body temperatures to see how well they yeah. survive. But yeah, that's a good question. They don't, they don't, I could say the free living adults do not, we have some unpublished data showing that free living adults do not survive as well at warm temperatures. Um, but that makes sense because those are free living. We haven't tried that with a parasitic adults, for example. And do you see co-infection with malaria? Because if they can survive um, inside a malaria infected person, then fever doesn't bother them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think so. I mean, I yes, I, I think that that is yeah. common, but I don't know how carefully it's been looked at, you know, like the- It's a hard thing to measure. Like, right, because I think a lot, you know, a lot of people, they don't always know that they're infected with strongylides, right? And so I think it's hard to say, and when you're in an endemic region, I think it's hard to say that like, you weren't clearing out some of the worms because of the fever and then getting reinfected. I don't know if anyone's done a careful study of like confirming that people are infected and quantifying worm burden before and after. So yeah, like I, I think yeah. it's, I think it's clear that they can to some extent survive, but yeah, whether some don't, I don't know. Cool. Um, do we have any more questions? Um, great. In that case, thank you so much, Alyssa. It was a really great talk. Um, really interesting. Even for people who know nothing about worms. Uh, <laughs> Thanks so much for having me. No, no problem. And we'll have another gripping seminar on the 13th of January. So if everyone, everyone can come in back. Okay. Great. Thank you very Thanks. much. Great. Have a nice Thank weekend, you. everyone. Bye.